Salamu alaikum. Peace be with you. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of Allah, the entirely merciful, the specially merciful. My name is Ayub Karim and welcome to my channel Quran Inspires Me. I begin this video by drawing your attention to a gentleman who goes by the handle the real Steven Seagal. Maybe I'll survive. Maybe I will get lucky. Maybe not. Please go to my comment page and look at all his comments. But I draw your attention to this particular comment. I quote, So this fool's logic is, if there is difficulty in performing Juma, he decides to leave Islam. He was just lazy to go for namaz. I am not really concerned about his emotional outbursts and insecurities. However, I draw your attention to this one particular statement of his where he says, I quote, he was just lazy to go for namaz. I do not know this person, nor do I know how old he is, but the fascination is that he actually used the word namaz. Since the late 80s and early 90s, there was a strong shift in the madrasa system to use the word salah instead of namaz. The idea was to dispense of using the word namaz. Although they say it is the Urdu word, but in reality it is strongly linked with the Zoroastrian belief and that is the belief that the so-called ulama want to destroy. They can try as much as they wish. People are still using the word namaz as shown in the example of the real Steven Seagal. The ulama can call it by whatever name they want to. They can even go to the mosque 10 times a day to read namaz. But you will never be able to establish salah. But you will most definitely be performing namaz, which is a Zoroastrian pagan practice, which was brought into Islam and now being practiced by Muslims for the last 500 to 900 years. I have already uploaded a few videos on the difference between namaz and salah. The root letters for salah is found 99 times in the Quran and the word namaz is not found even once in the Quran. So how was it possible that our great grandparents and our grandparents and our parents and people like me and people like the real Steven Seagal are still calling it namaz? How is this possible? The answer is simple. Our so-called ulama did not know what salah is because they were brainwashed into thinking that namaz was salah. I dare any one of them to prove me wrong. Calling me names like Tambi and from Chesworth and smoking weed from a young age are not intellectual arguments. So I just overlook them because I understand these are emotional outbursts. I know that for a fact as I used to be a Sunni until I decided to read the Quran and to understand the Quran. So I appeal to this person. I invite you, the real Steven Seagal, to start with the Quran and Allah will change your life like you never anticipated, which people like the so-called ulama will never ever be able to do for you. Okay, let us talk about Salah, the part about communication. The most formidable firepower in any military expedition does not guarantee a victory. The critical factor for a decisive victory is the devastating influence of uncompromised communication, which within the context of the Quran is Salah. When that communication is compromised or becomes compromised, that war can go either way. So you have to give your Salah, your communion as you receive it. That is to give it the original meaning. Wa'atu zakah. Whatever the communication, we cannot, we must not edit it, nor change it. That is salah, part of which is communication. In my previous video, I addressed the sunnah of Allah, which is part of salah, the communion. So today, I will be dealing again with salah, but the communication aspect. Most people believe that the root cause of all evil is money, or rather the lack of money. 
I say that according to the Quran, the root of all evil is miscommunication or misleading communication. When a husband and wife have a disagreement, it is because of miscommunication. When family members have disagreement with other family members, it is because of miscommunication. Let us take this argument a couple of notches higher. When one sect of Sunnism has a disagreement or disagreements with other sects of Sunnism, it is because of miscommunication. So, from where does this miscommunication originate? The answer is simple. But how many people actually believe in the Quran? The Quran states, وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَةِ Establish Salah, وَأَتُ zakah And keep it clean. And give the communication. We will talk more about the various forms of communication, but the catch, the fundamental rule, the uncompromising factor in any communication is that you have to give it in its original meaning. That means you cannot add to that communication. And neither can you dilute it. And you are not allowed to change it. Without this fundamental clause, Wa'atu zaka, there is really no need for communication. Zaka has nothing to do with money. It has nothing to do with charity. It has everything to do with keeping it pure. That is zaka in relation to Salah. So when we look at the various sects of Sunnism, they do not speak with one unified voice. Each sect has its own rulings. That is why they are so divided. Which means that they do not establish Salah. They read Namaz thinking that they are doing Salah. They are far, far, far away from Salah. So let me take this example to show you that God knows what He reveals and what He does not reveal. Let us take for example the law of inheritance which is revealed in the Quran as follows. Now you may be asking yourselves what has the laws of inheritance got to do with Salah? It has a lot to do with enlightening the reader of the Quran so you will see as we proceed into the subject of communication. So let us read Surah 4 verse 11 and 12. Allah directs you as regards your children's inheritance. To the male, a portion equal to that of two females. If only daughters, two or more, their share is two-thirds of the inheritance. If only one, her share is half. For parents, a sixth share of the inheritance to each if the deceased left children. If no children and the parents are the only heirs, the mother has a third. If the deceased left brothers or sisters, the mother has a sixth. The distribution in all cases after the payment of legacies and debts. You know not whether your parents or your children are nearest to you in benefit. These are settled portions ordained by Allah, the all-knowing, the all-wise. Now we read verse 12. In what your wives leave, your share is a half if they leave no children. But if they leave a child, you get a fourth after payment of legacies and debts. In what you leave, their share is a fourth if you leave no child. But if you leave a child, they get an eighth after payment of legacies and debt. If a man or woman whose inheritance is in question has left neither ascendants nor descendants but has left a brother or a sister, each one of the two gets a sixth. But if more than two, they share is a third after payment of legacies and debts. So that no loss is caused to anyone. Thus it is ordained by Allah and Allah is all-knowing, most forbearing. That is what Allah gave us. If we change any one of these ordinances given by Allah in the Quran, that would be interpolation of the Quran, whereby you will be rejecting the Quran, which will make you a kafir. So Allah gave us this breakdown, because it is best for us, because it is important. That is why He revealed it to us, so we can comply to this law. This makes sense, because Allah is the creator of numbers. He understands fractions. That is why he gave the law of inheritance because he saw it is very, very important factor of succession in life. Now, let us look at Salah. 
and I want you to think. Please think. Allah just told us to establish Salah. Establish Salah without giving us any number of rakats. Without telling us what to read in each rakat. And He did not give us the various positions of bowing and prostration. Now ask yourself, why for inheritance He gave us the numerical breakdown? But for Salah, which the ulama say it is the most important ibadah in the Quran, then how come Allah did not give us the number of rakats? He did not give us the number of rakats because they are not important. They are not part of Salah. One of the most frustrating arguments from the Sunnis is that they tell us, Allah tells us to pray Salah, but He does not give us the details. So they say, we have to go to the hadith to get those details. The hadith tells you how to read namaz and how many rakats in each namaz. Yes, I agree with the Sunnis. You go to the hadith for details on namaz, not salah. Not salah. Why did Allah not tell us that the laws of inheritance, you must also go to the hadith? How come? So who knows the law better? Allah, our creator, or your Imam Bukhari, your new God. That is who Imam Bukhari is to y'all. Think people, think. Do you all think that Allah forgot to give the number of rakats and now this Imam Bukhari is filling in for Allah? Are you people of right mind? The format of Salah has no rakats. Salah is to recite the Quran. Clearly, without messing it up, which is the first and foremost Salah that we need to read the Quran to others so that they will also learn the Quran and practice the Quran and not to practice your Imam Bukhari's nonsense. One of the worst disclaimers I ever come across is that when people write an article on any Islamic subject, especially the so-called ulama, they end it off by stating, and Allah knows best. Of course, Allah knows best. They think because they write this, they will not be liable for what they wrote if they are wrong. This is probably the worst disclaimer I ever came across. If you believe that Allah knows best, then why don't you go to the book of Allah, the Quran? Because the Quran is Allah's revelation. So quite rightly, Allah knows best. But you quote from the ahadith of the Sahih Sitta and I don't know who else and say Allah knows best is a mockery unto Allah but you do not realize it. You are behaving so stupidly. You think that Allah will not see that. Or if Allah sees that, He will forgive you because you wrote and Allah knows best. If you do not know, just say, I don't know. So, let us look at the battle of Uhud. What happened at the battle of Uhud? But before I go there, my dear brothers and sisters, dear viewers, I would be grateful if you subscribe, share, like and comment. It will be of great help to us and to others. Also, please hit the notification bell so that you will be notified of our new videos that are uploaded. So, what happened at the Battle of Uhud? I want all you Sunni brothers and sisters to please go back to your ulama and ask them what happened at the Battle of Uhud. Ask them. See what answer you get. Then come and watch this video. Continue watching this video and see the difference. What happened at the Battle of Uhud? Communication was compromised. Salah was compromised. So let us read Surah 3 verse 152 and 153. Allah did indeed fulfill His promise to you when you, with His permission, were about to annihilate your enemy until you flinched and fell to disputing about the order and disobeyed disobeyed it after he brought you in sight of the booty which you covet. Among you are some that hanker after this world and some that desire the year after. Then did he divert you from your foes in order to test you, but he forgave you, for Allah is full of grace for those who believe. Verse 153 Behold, this is in the Quran, this is about the Sahaba, 
This is about the companions of the Prophet. Verse 153. Behold, you were climbing up the high ground without even casting a side glance at anyone and the messenger was in your rear calling you back. There did Allah give you one distress after another by way of requital to teach you not to grieve for booty that had escaped you and for the ill that had befallen you for Allah is well aware of all that you do. Now, you know, when I recite these ayahs to people, they look at me stunned. I mean, where am I getting it from? It is in the Quran. People don't read the Quran. So what exactly happened here? This is just one example of what happens when communication, salah, is compromised. The companions of the Prophet disobeyed his communication. They, the companions of the Prophet, disobeyed the Prophet Salah. So from this, we learn that any communication should not ever be compromised. You keep it pure. You keep it clean. You keep it in the original form that you received it. And even when you pass on that communication, you make sure that you relate it in its original form. You are not allowed to make any changes. For example, you receive communication that there are 2,000 soldiers at the right flank. You cannot pass on that communication saying that there are more than 2,000 soldiers at the right flank. Once you do this, you compromise the communication. You compromise your salah and you will bring upon yourself a great misfortune like that of what happened to the companions of the Prophet at the Battle of Uhud. I am using this as an example. There are other examples as well. The Battle of Hunayn, you can go to the Quran and have a look at it. But the point is that we need to apply this Salah in all aspects of our lives. Now, let us look at Surah 4, verse 101 to 103. Verse 101. When you set forth in the earth, there is no blame on you if you shorten your communication. For fear the unbelievers may attack you. For the unbelievers are unto you open enemies. Verse 102. Even when thou art with them and establish for them the communication, let one party of them stand up with thee, taking their arms with them. When they have submitted, let them take the positions in the rear and let the other party come up which had not yet followed. Then let them follow with thee. Taking all precautions, and bearing arms. The unbelievers wish you were negligent of your arms and your baggage to assault you in a single rush. But there is no blame on you if you put away your arms because of the inconvenience of rain or because you are ill. But take precautions for yourselves. For the unbelievers, God had prepared a humiliating punishment. Verse 103 When you complete the communication, Remember Allah's establishment, sitting and on your sides. And when you have rested securely, then establish the communication. Indeed, the communication is on the believers at prescribed times. Take note of the word which appears in verse 103, the second word, Kadaitum. Look at the definition and see how it refers to finishing a speech. Hence, it makes sense that the Prophet had to communicate the message of not only the Quran, but also communicating the military strategies to his followers verbally and not by performing any ritual acts. So according to verse 103, the Prophet had to communicate with his army or his soldiers and they were asked to establish the Salah because communication is on the believers at prescribed times. So, the prescribed times are three times according to the Quran. Morning, midday and night. Now, what constitutes Salah? Communication. So, we get together in groups, twos or threes or fours, any number will do, even on your own. But get into groups and everyone should have a turn in reciting the Quran to the others in the language they understand. It does not have to be lengthy sessions. 15 to 20 minutes of reading, 
followed by a further 15 to 20 minutes of discussions. Another very important aspect of communication. This is supposedly should be done at Juma, where the welfare and concerns of the public are addressed. This is where the masjid becomes an assembly, like the house of assembly, where problems of the community are discussed to bring solutions to the people who have certain plights and problems. So you create a working community to address these issues and find the best possible solution. Furthermore, the other important communication is that we inform the people of new developments and advances and teach others, educate others, so that this will bring about progress, advancement and upliftment of the community. That is establishing Salah. On the Day of Judgment, the disbelievers will be invited to sujood, submission. But they will not be able to. They used to be invited to the sujood, but they disbelieved and denied. So Allah says, leave me with those who denies the Quran. They were invited to the sujood, to the submission, but denied and disbelieved. What were they invited to? The Quran. What did they deny? The Quran. They had a chance to believe and be humbly submissive to the Lord by accepting and following the Quran. But they chose to disbelieve and deny it instead. Are you of those that deny submission to Allah? I mean submission and not physical prostration. Are you one of them? Until my next video, I am Ayub Karim from Quran Inspires Me. Understand the Quran to experience the revelation. Salamun alaikum. Peace be with you.